I can hear me, so I hope you can too. Let us stand if you could. You can only stand if you can smile. There's a couple. Okay. We'll take a couple. Page 288 in your big books. Page number 288. Page 288. Light of Along a dark and gloomy path, I crop beneath the shades of death. No hope beyond my dying breath, till light from the Savior came in the light of God. Now my soul is singing. All, all is bright in the light of God. Oh, I'm now in the light of God. My darkness now is passed away. In Jesus, all is perfect day. And peace and comfort ever stay since Christ is my perfect light in the light of God now my soul is singing all all is bright in the light of God oh I'm now in the light of God oh Jesus to my heart so sweet thy words a light unto my feet how holy happy and complete I walk in the precious light oh in the light of God now my soul is singing all, all is bright in the light of God. Oh, I'm now in the light of God. All glory to my Savior's name. To do thy will, my highest aim. Thy favors more than earthly fame. Thy smile is my constant light in the light of God. Now my soul is singing, all, all is bright in the light of God. Oh, I'm now in the light of God. Amen. Let's remain standing for prayer. please our father in heaven we thank you what a blessed privilege it is to be in the light of God and we thank you oh God for your word that has been a light upon our path we thank you oh God for what you have shown us through your word and you've helped us to see through the very light that you shined within our hearts, you allowed us to see our condition, that our righteousness was as filthy rags. And you helped us, O oh God, to realize when we saw our real condition, darkness, it gave us a hunger and a thirst to be saved and to be in the light. And we thank you, God, for this so great a salvation. Where in the world would we be had it not been for Jesus? And Lord, as we move closer to eternity, we see a world that's aflame, a world that's in chaos, a world that's in darkness. 
And oh God, our hearts have become heavy thinking about all of our friends and loved ones, those that are away from thee. And so many are not even aware of what's going on. They're not feeling that sense of nearness of God. They're looking at wickedness that is surmounting the wickedness that came up as a stench in your eyes during the time of Noah, during the time of the cities of the plain. Lord, what we're seeing today is worse, and it's getting worse every day. And it makes us sense that, and it makes us feel like you're near because it was the stench that came up before you that caused you to say, I repent that I've made man and that they've become so wicked. Lord, help us. We need to awaken those around us. We need to awaken those among us. And even as we spend a lot, a lot of hours today trying to call and talk to people and remind them that revival is here. And oh, how important it is for us to all draw closer to God and closer to one another as we see the day approaching. And Lord, we just pray that you'll help us. Help us to have a good revival. Anoint the brethren as they come. Lord, give them timely messages. Let the anointing fall on them in a special way. And as the word goes forth from their mouths, let the anointing fall on us and help us, O oh God, in whatever way we can to move up and whatever more we can do, show us that we can have a greater impact upon the lost around us. Lord, this old world is just, they're in a state of apathy. They're in a state of intoxication, spiritually speaking. So many are planning this and planning that, and there's nothing wrong with that stuff, but there is something wrong with it when they're not ready to meet you. And, oh, God, we pray that you'll help us Open the windows of heaven during this meeting. Lord, call the church to a greater awakeness and help us, oh God, to understand that we need to be about our Father's business. Lord, you know all about the homes where death has entered, those that we've spoke to today. And Lord, we just pray that you'll help them, that you'll help them to realize that they'll find strength and grace in thee and thee only to be able to go on. And we ask, Lord, that you'll also be with the many sick and afflicted. Those are seniors, Lord, that are so shut in. And Father, we just pray that you'll give them strength, some strength to even come who haven't been here for a long time. And those who are unable, Lord, bless them through the, through the live stream. Lord, visit them in a special way. We pray, O oh God, that you'll meet with us now in this midweek service. Bless everyone that participates, the singers, the players on instrument, whatever said, whatever's done, let it meet with your approval. And O oh God, help us spend a few moments talking to thee about this revival and about the great needs that our country is in today. How we thank you, Father, in the midst of it all. And there's a lot of it. We can have peace in the time of trouble. And we thank you, O oh God, for your peace. A peace that the world doesn't give, but a peace that comes from heaven and we thank you for that. Now, Lord, bless our gathering this evening. You know all about the sick. And we just pray that you'll be with each and every one. Lift spirits, touch bodies, and open hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
page number 444, Rescue the Parachute. While we take our evening tithes and offerings, it's been a long time since, I, since I've seen this, sang this song, so I might butcher it, but we'll do this together, okay? Page number 444, Rescue the Perishing. <clears throat> Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We pour the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, with them gently he will forgive if they only believe rescue the perishing care for the dying jesus is merciful jesus will save verse number four rescue the perishing duty demands it strength for thy labor the lord will provide back to the narrow way patiently win them tell the poor wanderer a savior has died rescue the perishing care for the dying jesus is merciful jesus will save Brother Chad has a special for us tonight. There's a song Sherm and Evelyn sang a long time ago. I'm not going to try that one, but it says... Uh, Too many mountains lie behind me. Uh, you know that once you've made one step toward God, it's it's too many steps to go back, right? Just one step, and you've you've went too far to go back. And I'm thankful that He's so long suffering and patient with us. You know, I was thinking the other day. The disciples asked, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? He goes, no, 70 times seven in a day. So, you know, I, I try to tell our young people that, you know, if you mess up, he'll forgive you. He didn't send his son down here to go through all that he went through to deny you forgiveness. And I'm so thankful for that. This song says, I have come too far to turn around. And Cody usually sings it with me, but I'm going to sing it by myself. Give me that F one more time. I have started out with my Jesus, and with him I'm going to stay. And no matter what trials may befall me, to make heaven my home is my destiny. And I have come too far to turn around, so I will not look back now. I am too close to home, you see, so I will not turn back now i can see the lights see the lights of home and they're getting closer and closer each day 
And with every passing hour, it becomes one day less till I see his face. And I have come too far to turn around so I will not look back now. I am too close to home, you see, so I will not turn back now. It'll be worth it after all, child. It'll be worth it after all, after all of these trials. We'll hear Jesus call when we sit at the feet of Jesus, all the saints around his throne. You see, I've come too far now, so I must keep pressing on. And I have come too far to turn around so I will not look back now. I am too close to home, you see, so I will not turn back now. I am too close to home, you see, so I will not turn back. No, I just won't turn. No, I just can't turn back now. Mr. Faith has a course. You've been my friend for so long. You were right, and I was wrong. I can't repay all the love you've given me. You were my friend when no one cared. I was alone, but you were there. Lord, you're the best thing that ever happened.
pray for Sister Donna Romine. I'm going to come and share a devotion with us. Let's receive her with an amen. All right. Good evening. Before I forget, I need to announce that there will be a trustees meeting October the 28th at 6 p.m. That needs to get announced leading up to the trustee meeting, but sometimes it gets forgotten, so I expect you trustees to remember. I just uh, very briefly want to speak to you tonight. Um, just a few simple thoughts. Um, whenever I was young, growing up in the hills of Kentucky, the best thing, my best memory, is playing hide-and-go-seek. Uh, my pa lived on top of a hill. That's my grandfather. That's my pa. He lived on top of a big old hill, and uh, he, you know, this little flat place on top of the hill, and there was the house, and he had several little outbuildings. One, I think, he um, cured meat. He had one little old... They looked like outhouses, but they were for preserving meat. One, he used salt. Another one was a, a little smokehouse. And one they called a, a wash house. I don't even know what that was about. But um, he had two porches, a front and a back one, and he trees and hills. And, oh, it was just the best thing in the world. Because a lot of the times, you know, all, some of his daughters would come home with all their youngins and, They'd sit on the porch, and they're talking, and it's twilight time. You can hear the whooper wheels and the hoot owls, and all of his kids are done. Now it's time to play hide-and-go-seek because, you know, you can't see very good. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just the best thing. It's just the best thing, you know, and it, it's a little scary, too, because, uh, you know, all the big kids would run and hide, and I was one of the youngest ones. They'd all run and hide, and, you know, um, I'm out trying to find them all. And all by myself, just a little bitty kid, and you can hear the, you, sometimes you can hear a coyote, sometimes you can hear a wildcat, and there's all these noises. He had mountains all the way around his house, ain't no telling what was in them woods. So there was a, there was a, a thrill about it, you know, doing the seeking and going and finding these people. And, and then my ornery aunts and my uncles, uh, um, they were all close to my age. This is my Paul's second family. Anyway, you know, right before I'd get up to them, they'd jump out and scare me to death, and that's just the best. <laughs> that, that was a good time on a Friday night. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, just thinking about that, and the, the Lord, whenever he was talking to me about that, I was thinking about, you know, playing hide-and-go-seek for real. Um, it was just wonderful. But um, playing hide-and-go-seek, you know, life can be a little like playing hide-and-seek. You know, there's times that we have a crisis, we have troubles, we have trials that come our way, and you can hear all the scary noises, like I just shared that we could hear them critters in the woods, and you can hear all these things and things that just scare you to death and make you afraid, and you know, when those times come, there's nothing better than a good hiding place, is there? You just can hide out and nobody can find you, and that's wonderful. But you cannot stay there. You cannot stay there. It's wonderful to find a place of quiet rest, you know, near to the heart of God. We sing these songs. You know, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. There's the times whenever you have a great crisis and great trial, it's wonderful to run, to just run. You know, and I was thinking of Jesus telling them in Jerusalem, you know, I would have gathered you up like chicks, you know, and covered you with my wings, and I think of that, and I thought, what a wonderful place to hide, but you can't just hide forever, there's effort that has to be done, sometimes it's your turn to seek, amen, well, um, I was thinking all these thoughts, and, um, and in this little devotion, I want you to understand when I'm talking about hiding, hiding can also mean to rest, to trust, to stay, to abide, to be still, there is so many scriptures, it'll take too long to get into all of those, but um, one scripture that came to mind, um, and I have it marked in my Bible, and I'm afraid I'm going to get way off track if I start flipping through a Bible to find scriptures, but the psalmist says um, that 
in Psalms 56 and 3. He says, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. And just like there's a, all the wonderful places to hide at my Paul's house, our father has a lot of places to hide. And, uh, you know, Psalm 17, 8 says, hide me under the shadow of thy wing. Psalms 61 and 12, he says, from the ends of the earth, I will cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock, a good place to hide. Lead me to the rock that's higher than I. And uh, Psalms 27 and 5 speaks of the Lord hiding us in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. And I just shared some of the hymns that we sing of how that the Lord can shelter us and hide us when life is overwhelming, when it gets too much. But as we said, we can't stay there forever. Life must be lived out. Um, if, you, if you shut down and you hide too long, you're going to start sounding like my youngest grandbaby. She's just starting to talk, and all of her sentences right now starts with, I not. I asked her if she wanted to eat. I not eat. And I said, well, um, you want to jump on bed? I not jump on bed. I said, well, you want to drive my car? I not drive your car. <laughs> She's just not doing nothing. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes in our times of crisis or if somebody wounds us or something's going on with us, we can sound just like her if you hide out too long. I not go to church, I not help, I not teach, I not sing, because we've imploded on ourselves. Amen? So the, the whole premise of this devotion is to just say, in those times, while you're hiding, there's also, unlike playing hide-go-seek, there's something you have to do in those times, and that is to seek God's face while you're hiding. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, what are, we, you know, what are we seeking for? And I'm sure some of you, the first word that popped in your mind, we're seeking for answers. You know, when trouble comes or heartache comes, crisis comes, whatever it is, the first thing in our mind is why. Why? Why did this happen? Why am I having to go through this? You know, how long, oh, Lord, was the children of Israel's cry every time? Is it how long, Lord, have we got to go through this? How long is this going to take? And why? And we've got all these questions. And the Lord just showed me something, and, and I, I don't know how I've lived this long, and it never occurred to me before. But um, to ask our questions why, God rarely, and I've thought about this, it is rare if ever he tells us why. Why the storm? Why the crisis? Why the heartache? Why the pain? He never tells us why. And I thought of his disciples on the Sea of Galilee in that boat. And, you know, Jesus is sleeping and the storm's coming. And they're thinking they're going to die. And they go to him. And in and, and, and a roundabout way, they didn't say, why? You know, why did you put us in this storm? Why are we going through this? But he, they're like, don't you care that we're dying? And Jesus didn't get up and say, well, you know, here's why this is happening. You know, because the answer if he answered our questions, our whys, and our how longs, that ain't going to do a thing for you. Have you ever thought about that? Knowing why I'm facing this battle don't make the battle easy. Knowing why that this crisis has come, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't solve anything. It doesn't fix anything. Knowing why that somebody mistreated me or harmed me, that doesn't make the pain go away to know why they're acting like that, does it? The answer to why you're in the storm that you're in, the answer why doesn't, it's unnecessary to know why. But you know what Jesus knew that they needed? The answer to, Lord, don't you care? He gets up and he speaks peace. <laughs> what They didn't need to know why am I in this storm. What they needed was peace. Amen? And it's the same thing for whatever you're going through. That's why there's a wonderful place to hide in the shelter of his arms. But while you're there, you need to seek his face. Not for the answers to why, but you need to seek his peace. You need to seek his wisdom. You need to seek his guidance. Because you've got to come out of hiding sometime. And there's going to be a real devil to fight. There's going to be a real battle that you've got to face. Um, you know... Oh, you all know how life is. I'm preaching to the choir right now, and I understand that. <laughs> but just remember that when life gets hard and the storms come 
and you don't know where to go, and then you don't know where to turn. You don't need to know why. Why is beside the point. You know, the same thing with Job. Whenever Job went through all his troubles, Job didn't say, now listen, Job, me and the devil had this conversation, and I told him if he put you through all this, you would remain faithful. So this is why that you lost all your children. I mean, wouldn't that... <laughs> I would feel very used if I was Job. <laughs> But Job, he, he didn't know why this was happening. But when God finally spoke, he just showed him his power and his might and his wisdom because that's what Job needed. There's someone bigger than myself that has all the answers. He's able. He can do anything. That's what you need to know, not the whys and the wherefores and how comes, but you need to know that there's a God that can take care of you and like I said, when you're in your desert, when you're in your storm, and David, in one part of this, he if you read, um, I was just reading it this day, today, David said that, um, let me see, I want to find this scripture for you real quick. Uh, let's see, well, I have, I thought I put it in my notes. Oh, here it is, it's in Psalms 109 and 4. If you read uh, verses 1 to 3, David is talking about this one's after me, that one's against me. There's a lot of chaos and, and pain and hardship going on in his life. And David, um, and half of that scripture says, all this is going on, and he says, I give myself to prayer. I don't know if you ever caught that reading that. I give myself to prayer. While he's hiding, he's seeking God's face. And I and and don't we have a lot to seek God's face for? Because, you know, Brother Tony has shared with us, you look at the news, he um, explaining what's going on in the world and how that affects the church and, and, you, and just your own crisis and trials and troubles. You know, you can't hide forever, but, why, but you need to hide sometimes. But while you're there, don't forget to seek him. Seek his wisdom, seek his kingdom, whatever fits your situation. Seek his grace, seek his comfort, seek his healing, whatever it is you need. There's times you need to hide, but while you're hiding, seek. <laughs> seek the Lord. Seek the Lord, look to him, cling to him, and he has the answers. Maybe not the answers you're looking for, but he has what you need. Because, like I said, answers why it don't stop the pain, it don't do anything for you. But the Lord knows what you need, and what it is is that He's able. The battle is His. That we could go on all day, but I'm jumping out, Brother Tony. If you want to come back, but I was thinking with the revival coming up and all that's going on, we really need to do some seeking, seeking His face. There's a lot of needs. There's a lot of people who are sick and struggling, and we can't, like I said, can't be like my grandbaby. You know, I've, I'm hurt, I'm sad, I'm mad, I'm sick, so I'm not. I'm not doing that. But, you know, just, Lord, thy will be done. Give me the grace and strength to bear one another's burdens and help my brother and sister along, and let's all pull together and, um, and seek his face. Thank you. Sister Donna just mentioned that life is like the game of hide and seek. And immediately when she said that, my mind started running. And <clears throat> when was the first time that mankind played hide and seek? In the garden. Amen? Smart group. In the garden. And why did they run and hide? They knew they had sinned. But here's the point. 
They were hiding, the Bible said, from the presence of God. And I thought, there's people probably in many churches who have been in God's presence, be it through singing, testimony, the very worship, sermons, whatever. And they found and they've tasted that the Lord is good. And what is the one thing that makes worship so blessed? It's when we come into God's house and we get lifted up together in heavenly places. And we cherish that. And we cherish those kinds of services where God's anointing and the gifts of the Spirit are operating and God's presence is flowing through all the gifts, the testimonies, the music, <clears throat> the sermons, whatever's going on. But it's a wonderful atmosphere to be in. And the saints raise their hand and they come to the altar and this, that, and the other thing. And it truly is one of the best places in the world to be in the presence of God. And now, here we are, getting ready to start a revival. And a pastor's greatest concern is, will the saints look and run for a place to hide from the revival? I've called 20 families and I've got another 20 to go. And you know what kills me? Oh, we're having a revival? Something's wrong. That ought to have been the highlight of the month, of the fall season, the spring, the summer. And I thought as you were preaching, Sister Donna, how many Adam and Eves are going to run and hide during this revival? But here's the irony and the sadness. There's no place to hide. Nobody can run from the presence of God. Amen? You can go to the bottom of the sea. You can go as far west or as far east or south or north. There's no place to hide. And that day is coming when everybody is going, or not everybody, but a lot, a lot of people are going to wish that they hadn't run from the presence of God. And I thought, what, what, what makes people run from the presence of God during revival? Do you know how many churches in this land no longer have revivals? No longer have prayer meetings? And it just seemed to me like a lot of God's people are running and hiding from God's presence. And yet, look at our history. You'd have to go way back somewhere and it'd be very hard to find where we ever had a bad revival or wherever we had a bad camp meeting. God's presence has been good to the Church of God in Lincoln County. I don't know what's it been, 33? 
32 years now going, going on 33. Is that going on 34? Going, coming on 35 next year. And we can still look back 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, 15 years, and we're still slicing off a little bit of glory from those revivals of the past and from those camp meetings of the past. Amen? I love it when I'm out and about and I run into someone from this church who hasn't been in church for a long time. And this one person was coming and, and that person and me were going into the same place. And I said, oh, how are you? We're missing you. They had wished they never saw me. They're hiding from God. I want to tell you something. The farther we go, and the more the climates become unfavorable towards the presence of God, the more it's affecting the saints. We're fighting for survival. And it shouldn't be this hard to have a revival. How many of you can remember when we had camp meetings and revivals, the excitement that was in the air, the anticipation? And young mothers with children, they'd all be lined up in the services like little ducks. Everybody was excited about having revival. And every time we have a revival or a camp meeting or whatever, I have to go out looking for the missing children. And I'll text them or I'll call them or I'll run into them or I'll go visit them. Let's never be afraid of the presence of God. I mean, if you're going to run and hide, how about getting good at hiding from the devil? How about getting good at hiding from the world? How about getting good hiding from your flesh? But it's just the opposite. The flesh is on display like it's never been. People are catering to the flesh like they've never catered to the flesh. And with all the attractions and all the lights and all the medias and all the exciting things. Did you ever hear the news every day in Newark? This pretty voice comes on, and the big story today is, and you stop doing everything you do, what, 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 what's going on? Am I missing something? You're definitely missing something when you're running from the presence of God. How many of y'all agree with me tonight? Amen? You don't want to run from the presence of God. All it takes is a mood swing. All it takes is an argument with somebody. All it takes is being tired. All it takes is missing dancing with the stars. If you're well enough to sit home and watch TV and get a rise out of TV during 
the presence of God being on display, something's wrong. And listen, I know I'm preaching to the choir, right? The people that are here on Wednesday, you guys ought to have medals. Amen? But I'm telling you so you can go tell them. The pastor knows where you are. God knows where you are. The Holy Spirit knows where you are. Amen. See that? You you loaded my barrel. And this is the worst time probably in the history of America for our generations to run and hide from the presence of God. But there's an army of mothers that if the men won't stand up, they're going to stand up because they're not going to sit back. And you can all clap. They're not going to sit back and let somebody else teach their babies. And there's a brother in this congregation that showed me the apps, the the things that are being taught. And I want to tell you something. It's being taught right here in Newark. And the mothers are all meeting with these boards, right? School boards. And they're mad. And they're voicing their opinion. And they're not domestic terrorists. They're mothers. And they want to know what the government is teaching their children. Teaching them the 1619 teaching them that the whites are the people that have destroyed this country. If it wasn't for America, you know how many, there wouldn't hardly be half the countries left in the world. If it weren't for American military people and weaponry flying and and spilling the blood of thousands upon thousands of American sons, Mothers standing up. But the CRT is, that, that's, that's bad enough. Critical race theory, all this nonsense. No truth to any of it. But what's worse, and I couldn't even begin to tell you what's in the books of first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth graders. The vulgarity and the graphic wording and the vulgar wording that kids are being taught. Don't even know what you're talking about at the moment. Filthy stuff. Never mind the CRT. Get down where the rubber hits the road. You're not going to be teaching those kinds of words and those kinds of actions to my children. I'll die before I let you do that. And how many preachers and pastors are not standing up and saying anything about anything that's going on out there? Because they're running from the presence of God as well don't want to preach, doing a terrible disservice to their people, dumbing down their congregations. God, right on their pulpits, the American flag and the Black Lives Matter flag and the Christian flag, just keep running and keep hiding from the Lord. But I got bad news for the world. When the Lord shows up, 
his presence is going to become the most frightening thing that has ever hit earth. And it's going to be instant judgment. And nobody, nobody is going to try to argue. Nobody is going to do anything. Run from the presence of God. I thank God for a revival. They come right on time as far as I'm concerned. I need them, you need them, every church needs them. And we've got three speakers that I have all the confidence in the world that they're going to get some messages from the Lord and they're going to preach. And God's going to be so pleased with that, his presence is going to come into our midst. Elisha, you could tell us how dark Haiti is with their witchcraft and all that stuff. It's almost unbelievable, but where much is given, much is required. And if we squander the gifts and the blessings of God, we can become like any third world country. We can see darkness like we've never seen. We're seeing darkness now. Oh, it's, it's getting dark. It's getting dark, church. And yet, a finger from heaven is pointed to every one of us that claims to know the Lord. And it says, you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, you're the light of the world. And you're the salt of the earth. I didn't get to it Sunday. But so many evangelistic efforts really don't give converts a chance to prepare their hearts for salvation. And one of the greatest blessings that kids and young people can see is when the saints stand up in a public service, having just lost a loved one, lost a husband, lost a, a wife, lost a child, had to, went through bankrupt, whatever. And the kids and those that come in who don't know the Lord and they know somebody in the neighborhood and somebody in the family that's like a rock, and they see that person through the hardships and the adversities, and they don't see that saint charging God foolishly or sinning against God, but they see those saints maintaining their spiritual integrity and standing up like lions in the face of all kinds of adversity. That's what the world needs to see among the Christians. But they're not seeing that. They're seeing so many different displays of Christianity. And the Christianity they see looks like and acts like just they look like and how they act like in the world. And nobody's hearts are being prepared for salvation. There used to be a time saints would see, sinners would see something. And then that gives the Holy Spirit a better opportunity to convict that person. You've heard people say, well, when I get saved, I want to get saved like so-and-so. I want to live like so-and-so. I heard them stand up when their hearts were broken and never gave a moment's thought to turning their back on God or charging God foolishly. Never seen all that foolishness. We're just running and hiding from God in this country. And my, oh my, the more I 
I see and the more I hear that's going on, and I know most of you don't keep up with that, and that's fine. But I feel it in my soul. It's getting close. I don't know. At times, I don't see how things could get any worse. And then it gets worse. Politicians are standing up on their platforms saying to women, to mothers, it's none of your business what we teach your kids. We're the government. And they're messing with our kids right in Newark. And I don't know as any teachers or parents, I know there's some, I don't know if all. But if my wife and I had children, I can tell you, she'd be there first. And she'd want to know exactly and would want to see the curriculum in every book. And you know what will stop it? Is if every parent would take their kids out of the public schools, which belong to the devil, and either do homeschooling or Christian schooling and put them all out of business. So let's not run and hide from the presence of God. Let's pray and let's be excited. And if you're not there, let's ask God to excite us. And let's look forward to having a great revival. Amen? Amen. I got up early this morning, and I, I paid a hefty membership, and I haven't paid, played 25%, because I could sense the load that was on me the last year. And I went out to play this morning, and I was waiting for my friends to come around. And I was just putting around. And the urge to gal golf left me. And it was a beautiful day. And I said, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. But I know that I'm not supposed to be here right now. And I didn't even call him. And I just walked off the course. And I wasn't driving down the street 100 yards. And I got the phone calls that made me understand I was needed in the lives of some of God's people. And I didn't even feel bad about missing golf. And you all know I love the golf. And I said, Lord, you help me be more accessible if that's the case. Everything we think so important that we can't come to church. And I'm talking to you. I'm talking to those that are listening to me via live stream. And I called one mother today and I said, look, what can we do? to get your family back in church. I want to help. You see, this world wants you and me to think that what's going on out there is top priority. And all it is is a distraction. Keep us from praying and keep us from being about our Father's business. I'm not saying you can't go shopping, can't go flea marketing, can't go 
play ball. But everything needs to be done in moderation. And that comes down to a conviction. So how many of you want to have a good meeting? Let me ask you again, because that was terrible. How many of you, listen, just wink if you want to have a good meeting. How many of you want to have a good week, good meeting? Amen? Let's have a good meeting. We got sick people, folks. We got families that are hurting. Got to remember Millie. Got to remember Helen Bechtel. She's struggling for her life. She's on the ventilator. Can't get her breath. Her daughter calls me, her mother. Ellen's mother calls me, Sister Levina. Diane Nichols lost her husband, Bill. Brenda Wells lost her husband, Joe. The list goes on and on. We've got Jay Crouch. We've been praying for Sister Gerald's and that family we've been praying for. Sister Bennis, we've been praying for. Plans to be here Sunday. Want to remember my wife. Um, should hear something from James tomorrow on how the blood work went and uh, waiting to have the upper GI. Want to uh, remember uh, Pete Wilson's daughter, Misty Wilson. She's struggling. She was in the hospital down there in Lancaster. And um, she's not well. Want to remember her in prayer. Angel, we want to remember Mandy in prayer, right? And also Dave is sick, not well, both, both struggling. And your mom doesn't want to go to the hospital, is that correct? Yeah, and they told her that she didn't qualify for antibodies. But she's really struggling tonight, is my understanding. Oh, is she? Okay, I'm glad to hear that, because I text them both. Want to uh, remember Vicki Lewis? I haven't heard from her in a month, maybe three weeks. Sister Vicki Wolf, Chad, how's she doing? All right, Brother Linder's wife, we want to remember her in prayer. Sister Pettit, we want to remember her in prayer. Well, there's just so many people to pray for. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Brother Gayhart, uh, I'm going to ask Brother hey, Gayhart, before you come, Brother Gayhart, I want uh, Brother Elisha to come up here and pray for us and, and just pray for our revival and pray for the needs. Don't have to be a long prayer. And then, Brother Gayhart, I'd like for you to come up and close the service with prayer, okay? All right, good brother. And uh, I'm going to ask you to stay seated where you are. If you want to come down and, and kneel, that's fine, or kneel in your pew, that's fine. But let's not run, and I, I know you're not, but let's run to the Lord and not from the Lord's presence. Because what we need more than anything in this meeting is the presence of God. 
And anybody that's been in the presence for any length of time, you got to know there's no greater place in all the world to be than in the presence of God. Amen? So you agree with the one leading us in prayer, many other burdens we may have overlooked, but there's a lot of sick people, a lot of unsaved, and every family here represents probably somebody that needs God's help in one way or another. Yes, Sister Roger. Okay, Sister Vivian, we'll, we'll be praying. I know she hadn't been well. Okay. All right, let's just take a few minutes. We're going to have prayer, and then we're going to let you go. And then Brother Mike will be here Sunday morning, Mike Worley, and then we'll have a meal together. And, let's, and then we'll have Sunday night, Brother Mike will be preaching. And then Monday night and Tuesday night, Brother Mike will be preaching. Nathan will come in on Wednesday and Thursday. And then Brother Sizemore will come in on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning. And we'll have another meal and close the revival. Well, Tony, those yeah. Sunday service will start at 6 o'clock. You know, that's a good question. Uh, and I was talking to my wife about it the last two days. Let me get your your opinion. If we have the evening, now we've always had our evening services at 7 p.m. And the advantage there, it gives the people that are out of town and the ones that are working to come home and get ready and, and come to church. But the upside is if we have the service at 6, we can be out by about the time it's getting dark, 7.30. It gives you a little more. So I, I don't know what you prefer. So let me, just with this group, just think about it. How many would rather have the services in the evening at 7 p.m.? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm talking about for all week long. Yeah, yeah. So how many would rather have uh, the services at six all night, you know, all the night services? No, no, I'm talking about yeah, we always have it at 6 on Sunday. Well, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, that'll work because that's what we normally did. Okay? All right, so we'll have uh, Sunday, 10 o'clock and 6 p.m. And then Monday through Saturday... 7 p.m. And I just made everybody happy. Amen? A little compromise goes a long way. Okay, brother. God bless you. Look, you, you haven't been eating much in Haiti, have you? <laughs> Holy mackerel. Dude, they, how, they, how much weight they, did you lose? <laughs> it's the shirt. They like to make cut these shirts. Shirts real skinny and hate. Look, you're as flat. I bought, I you're, bought it in Haiti. You're as flat as a board. <laughs> God bless you. Let's have prayer, Brother Gayhart, a closing. All right. And let's look forward to the presence of God. Amen. See you next time. God, we come to you this evening. Um, we're thankful that uh, we can run to you to find a place to hide, and um, we want we want to. Find a place to hide in you this revival. We want to pl find a place to, um, to find you here in, in your presence. And uh, we don't want to run from your presence, but we want to run to you. And we just pray that that will be our attitude. Um, we'll take that attitude this week in uh, going into revival. That will be our heart. And that we can just, I pray that you will give us a burden to pray, Lord. Um, that you, your heart will be in us to, um, to pray for the lost. And for the sick in this way, Lord, that uh, we will not be cool and relaxed and overcome with anxiety and 
and the cares of the world, but uh, your, your heart and your burden for your people will be with us. We will have that care one for another and that uh, we can go into this revival um, hungry and open and ready for you to work and to move as you want to uh, in this meeting. And um, I pray you will bless the speakers, give them the messages e even now as uh, they prepare. Um, just pray you bless them. Um, pray you would help those many in this congregation who have lost loved ones and um, their passing leaves a big hole in their lives and uh, there's a lot of emotion there. Just pray that you will be a comfort to them and um, those who are sick, several are sick and I just pray that you will uh, give them strength in their bodies and um, just be with them in this time as they, um, they pull through these illnesses and some, some are dealing with cancer and um, chronic pain that uh, never, is never ending and it's something they face day to day. And uh, that's a tough situation and that's it's not something they, they don't know when the end is coming for that. And I just pray that you would give them comfort, give them strength and um, touch them even, Lord, and give them healing. Uh, we just pray that you will work in us and through us this revival. I just pray you bless us as we go out in the rest of this week. We will seek you and uh, we will begin to prepare for those who come and that are not here tonight, that may come during the revival, that we can be ready to be that light and be that witness, be that testimony, and um, that we can carry this revival and uh, be an uh, open vessel for you to fill. In your name we pray. Well, that down. I wondered when Brother Tony was filling a round of uh, Elisha's stomach and so forth, he might try that old trick on me, but he didn't do it. <laughs> well, before I pray, before I close the service, I want to give the Lord glory and thanks for bringing Vivian and I through the virus. It was two, three weeks there. I didn't know who was on top or who was on the bottom. We really, really had a rough time of it. We did get the antibiotics. We went in and got those. I spent eight hours getting the things. Vivian came out to the hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning and got me because she wasn't allowed to be with me. But the Lord has delivered us from that. We're getting her strength back gradually. But Vivian has the trigeminal neurology acting up now. So I want you, if you would, please to pray for her. You get real awful pain in your face and the top of your head, in fact, to the point you can't even stand it. And she's already on heavy medication for it, but it's, I don't know whether it's been the virus that's caused it to flare up or not. But do remember Vivian in prayer, if you'd bow your heads, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege that we've had tonight to come to the house of God. Extol your name. Thank you for the good devotional we were allowed to share. Good songs of Zion. Lord, it's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord, to feel the presence of the Lord as it move, he moves over the service. You know we've got this revival coming up in the very near future. You know, the evangelists have worked hard to get the messages they feel that you would have them to bring. God, we just pray that you would move upon the people, Lord, and God, just give them a, a great desire to be in the house of the Lord and hear the word of God go forth. God, those who are sick, give them healing to their body. Those that are grieved, help them to come to be encouraged. Enlighten those that need to be enlightened, and most of all, Lord, those that are unsaved, we pray that you would talk to their hearts and there might be souls born into the kingdom during this revival. Now go with us as we go our separate ways and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.